Well, hello everyone. My name is Justin McFarlane. Thank you for joining us today in our webinar on optimizing steam process heating applications. I want to introduce my co-presenter, Alec Newell, who's an applications engineer at TLD Corporation. And today we also have several collaborators working behind the scenes. We'll be answering any questions you have during the webinar. Any questions that we don't get to during the webinar, we'll be sure to follow up with you in an email. So before we move on to the next slide, and so that the rest of this presentation runs smoothly, I'm gonna ask that everyone, myself included, turn off their cameras. So today we're gonna to show you some real world examples of applications where TLV has been able to identify problems and provide solutions to help mitigate those issues. However, we recognize that what we show you may not reflect how your specific equipment operates. Any solutions we provide may not fully resolve existing problems. So I ask that you please read our disclaimer. Now, over the last few webinars that TLV has presented, we've covered several topics related to steam system optimization. Now, if you take a very elevated view of a steam system, the goals here are quite simple. We want to create steam at a boiler, distribute that steam to the plant, making sure that we're supplying dry steam to process equipment tracing. And as steam gives off its energy and condenses, we want to make sure to quickly drain that condensate in order to maximize the heat output to the process. Finally, we want to recover the remaining heat and condensate to maintain efficient operation. So TLB's approach to ensuring that a steam system is optimized to its fullest potential has three separate steps, as I've shown here. But today, we're only talking about steam using applications specifically to identify incidents and bottlenecks and to optimize performance of assets. So today our discussions of steam using applications are going to apply to the basic operation of process equipment like shell and tube heat exchangers, reboilers, process air heaters, tank coils, and many, many other different types of process equipment. However, to simplify our discussions, we're going to focus primarily on shell and tube heat exchangers. Now, when it comes to process heating equipment, we don't like to see things like temperature stratification, cross coils, or collars on channel heads intended to prevent leaks, or fouling on process heating surfaces. Now, before we get down to the meat of things, I want to mention just a few articles that are going to be very helpful supplemental reading material. So this first one, Steam Heat Exchangers Are Underworked and Oversurfaced, written by TLV's president, Jim Risco. So this article covers in great detail many of the concepts that we'll be discussing today, specifically as it relates to the concept of stall and steam heated process equipment. If you want to read more about steam system optimization, this is a very helpful article written by TLV's Mr. Alan Ho and Mr. Tetsu Yamita, written for Hydrocarbon Processing Magazine. And then to supplement that article, you can read about risk-based methodology for steam systems, written by TLV's Dr. Brian Kane. This discusses risk mitigation relative to API 580 and API 581. And each of these articles can be found on our website and in the handout section of today's webinar. So to begin our discussion today, I'm going to turn this over to Alec to begin the topic of heat transfer. Thanks, Justin. All the different steam using heat exchangers all have the same goal, to transfer latent heat of the steam in an efficient, optimized manner. Now look at the relationship of the heat transfer between two separated fluids. We have an equation Q equals UA LMTD. Q is the total heat transferred. U is the heat transfer coefficient, and this simply means how easily can that heat move through the material that's separating our process from our steam. Thickness and material type is gonna change this significantly. We have A, the amount of surface area that there is to transfer the energy from the steam to the product. And our last factor is LMTD, log mean temperature difference. Now this is the average temperature between our process and the steam as the process is going to be changing temperature throughout the heat exchanger. Let's look at a couple scenarios where we start to vary some of those um, 
sorry, we're changing some of those variables. Depending on what we're trying to heat, fouling of the heat exchanger or buildup of unwanted scale is bound to happen. And this can be very unpredictable or unpredictable, sorry. Because this occurs on the heat transfer surface between our steam and the product, it adds a layer of thermal resistance, which also reduces our U value. Once that U value starts to re um, reduce further, we're actually gonna start to, to diminish the total amount of heat transfer that this piece of equipment is capable of doing. The only way to undo the amount of fouling or scale buildup is to clean or replace those two bundles. And what if we have the wrong drainage device installed? Well, and your equipment starts to flood because of that. Well, steam holds all the latent energy driving this heat, ex heat exchanger, so we can no longer account for that surface area as this area is now filled with condensate. A reduced surface area also starts to reduce the amount of total energy that this heat exchanger is now able to transfer. In addition, operating a flooded heat exchanger can bring on several different issues that we'll discuss in a few slides. The last factor being our log mean temperature difference. With a set outlet product temperature, the LMT can be varied by modulating our steam pressure, which directly relates to our steam temperature. A modulating control valve allows us to rapidly change that steam pressure based on our heat exchanger needs. And with a properly selected drainage device, this also allows us to increase or decrease the total amount of energy that's being transferred based on our product. And this also does this in a way that doesn't give us the unpredictability of fouling or that unwanted equipment issues that comes from operating a flooded heat exchanger. What are some symptoms that we can look for when trying to determine if our steam process heating applications are performing as well as they should be? Well, an inconsistent product quality or outlet temperature. The steam control valve could be hunting for a sweet spot where there's not too much heat, but there's also enough pressure differential to push that condensate through our seam trap. And this could be a result of a, um, a flooded heat exchanger. Next, we have water hammer. I'm sure everyone's heard water hammer a few times if you've walked through a site, but has it ever been localized at a specific heat exchanger? That heat exchanger could be incurring um, a slow gradual damage that could just result in dimpled heat exchanger tubes, or it could get a more severe water hammer event that could potentially rupture a tube bundle. Tube bundle corrosion resulting in a frequent maintenance, not only costing you a new tube bundle, but also equipment and personnel time. This could be from operating a flooded heat exchanger. Subcooling condensate starts to react and form carbonic acid. This acid isn't very corrosive, but over time can cause a significant amount of corrosion. Gasket leaks occurring on some of your heat exchangers and gasket clamps or collars are needing to be installed. This is a result of operating a flooded heat exchanger. High or hot, hot steam temperatures on the high side and subcooling condensate on the low side will create a temperature stratification across that heat exchanger, resulting in a different thermal expansion from the high side to the low side. And this could um, potentially cause those lack, uh, sorry, those gaskets to start leaking. Condensate pressure is not high enough to be returned and having to be discharged to grade. All of these don't have to be disregarded as normal operation. These, these all, all of these symptoms are a result of improper drainage solutions. Now we'll cover four basic condensate drainage options. A steam inlet control valve with an outlet steam trap. The traditional approach to drained, draining condensate from a heat exchanger with a steam trap can always be made to function well as long as the pressure differential across our steam trap is always positive. With a positive pressure differential and the steam trap that's sufficiently sized, this provides an exceptional, or exceptional performance with regards to production rates, performance, and a tight set point control. 
This is accomplished by maintaining a relatively consistent U and A value while throttling steam temperatures upstream. The pressure differential is not positive. Steam temperatures may be perfect for a process demand, but the steam pressure doesn't have the hydraulic capability to overcome our back pressure. Condensate then begins to back up and flood our heat exchanger. Those lower two bundles that were previously exposed to steam are now surrounded by condensate, and now all three heat exchanger factors are being varied. Product outlet, outlets become more inconsistent, control point starts to worsen, and in, in addition, maintenance requirements are increased. An inlet control valve with a level pot is similar to a steam trap as that level pot is just going to act as an electronic steam trap. The level pot takes place of the trap receiver body and the control valve replaces the orifice mechanism of a traditional steam trap. This arrangement can operate with very high flow rate at high pressures. Because it operates in a similar manner to the steam trap, operation concerns remain the same. Without a positive pressure differential across that level pot, condensate can begin to flood the heat exchanger diminishing performance as well as reliability. The next drainage design is a condensate outlet control valve. The way this works is there's full inlet pressure to the heat exchanger and an outlet control valve throttles that to allow more or less heat. So if less heat is required, that control valve is gonna throttle back backing up condensate into the heat exchanger, varying the amount of exposed surface area. When production begins to ramp back up, the control valve opens, discharging that condensate. But there's no way for that control valve to detect if it's discharging more condensate or potentially live steam, as this control valve is monitoring outlet product temperature. This design is, um, this installation is designed to never stall, as there's always full inlet pressure to overcome the potentially high back pressure. However, because this design modulates heat exchanger surface area instead of steam pressures, this tends to be a more sluggish response time and can result in an inconsistent product temperature or different flow rates. This design is expected to have a higher maintenance cost due to the increased fouling corrosion and an inconsistent thermal expansion throughout its operation. Similar to the previous design, a condensate outlet control valve with a level override. This design is the exact same, but also includes a level override to help prevent live steam from blowing into the condensate return line. However, as a heat exchanger ages and too much fouling has occurred, this design can still leak live steam as the control valve is gonna open up just to try and meet product outlet temperatures. The last design we'll cover is a steam inlet control valve with an outlet condensate pump trap. This design includes a steam trap to prevent steam loss during positive pressure differential, as well as a pump to maintain a dry heating space during those negative pressure differentials. Because this design can pump against high back pressure and still function like a steam trap, it offers a solution that allows a heating space to be full of steam during any operating condition, as well as returning condensate. The pump trap design operates by only varying one heat transfer equation factor, LMTD. So this maintains an optimal production output, performance, as well as a tight set point uh, temperature. Now, I've been mentioning negative pressure differential as well as lack of pressure. This is also referred to as stall. I'm going to cover the basics and how we can assess an equipment operation. With a seam trap, we need to ensure we maintain an inlet pressure that is higher than our outlet pressure. This positive pressure differential is actually what allows that trap to function properly. When inlet pressures are low or may fluctuate, Below the outlet pressure, a steam trap can no longer discharge condensate, and this is called stall. During a negative pressure differential, a pump is required to fully drain the equipment. 
Now, what can cause a high back pressure? If the return system is being tapped into a condensate line that already has a high pressure, or any additional lifts or rises in the condensate piping, for, any two, for every 2.2 feet, it adds about one PSI back pressure to that steam trap. Maybe pipe diameters are small, causing a high frictional loss, or there's a bunch of valves or other fittings that may restrict flow. All of this needs to be considered when accounting for back pressure. On the upstream side of the steam trap, what causes a low equipment pressure? Well, low product outlet temperatures also require a lower steam temperature. Drop in product flow rates require less heat, so that control valve is going to throttle back even more, lowering pressures. In addition, oversurfacing. So the more surface area we have on our heat exchanger, the less steam pressure and temperature we're going to need to achieve the required heating. Here we have a shell and tube heat exchanger with an inlet control valve with and a TLV free float outlet trap. Product passes through the shell side of the heat exchanger. Steam is supplied to the control valve and then condensate is collected into our return system. Let's look at some design conditions so that we can properly size a drainage device. We'll need to know our product inlet and outlet temperatures, our steam supply pressure, as well as the return pressure. All those variables typically remain consistent, but these next variables can change based on operating conditions. So for a full load scenario, we have 10,000 pounds per hour of product flow and 6,200 pounds per hour of steam flow. And that results in a heat exchanger pressure of about 115 PSI, which leaves us a differential pressure across our steam trap of about 95 PSI. So when sizing a, a steam trap for this heat exchanger, what do we need to know? Well, we, we know our max flow rate, 6,200 pounds per hour. The differential across our steam trap was 95 pounds per PSI. And our inlet pressure to our steam system is 150. That's gonna be our PMO. So that steam trap still needs to operate just in case full pressure gets to it. We know our back pressure, which accounted for lift, frictional losses, as well as header pressure. And additional information, just so we can uh, pick out the right steam trap. So PMO, TMO requirements, those are operating conditions, PMA and TMA re requirements, so max allowable. If the, if the site has any material requirements or a preferred connection type, as well as if the site has any sort of standard for a safety factor. TLV typically re recommends at least a 50% sizing factor just to make up for those startup loads or even a system fluctuation. So first trap we look at is a JH7RLX-10. At 95 PSI differential, we have about 5,300 pounds per hour. Now it doesn't quite meet our condensate load and it also doesn't really account for any safety factor that we wanna include in our sizing. So we need to jump up one more size. So we look at a JH7.2 RX-10, and that gives us about 9,500 pounds per hour at that same differential. Now this, get, this also covers the full capacity as well as provides just over 50% safety factor. So this trap is gonna be perfect. Now, if we look at the same parameters as before, but we're no longer gonna operate at that full condition or full load condition. So our product flow rate is reduced. Now we have about 30, or sorry, 70, 7,300 pounds per hour of product flow and 4,500 pounds per hour of steam flow. This results in an equipment pressure of about 47 PSI, which then reduces our pressure differential to 27 PSI. So in that previous scenario, we had 95, and now we only have 27. But we also have a lower steam flow rate. So let's look at that trap again to make sure that trap is gonna function under this condition. And that JH7.2RX-10 actually has a sufficient capacity based on the load and the pressure differential. What happens if 
product loads continue to drop. So now we're looking at a product flow rate of about 5,000 pounds per hour and a steam flow rate of 2,800 pounds per hour, resulting in an equipment pressure of 11 PSI. Well, that doesn't have enough pressure to overcome our, our return pressure. So now we're operating in a negative pressure differential. So a pump trap is gonna have to actually be required just to operate in this condition. So how can we assess that heat exchanger and determine when it's gonna stall? Well, this is what we call an extended stall chart. And there's several different things going on. So let me walk you through that. At the bottom, we have our load percentage. And once we're finished, this is gonna tell us at what load percentage are we gonna operate in, in that stall condition. On the right side, we have our steam pressure. To the left of that is the corresponding steam temperatures. When we start looking at this application, um, we want to plot our product temperatures. So we have T1 going to T2, which is going to provide our average product temperature. We can plot our steam pressure with its corresponding steam temperature and draw that line down to our average product temperature. And this is actually going to give us our uh, equipment pressure at any given load percent. So if we plot this against our back pressure, this is gonna this is gonna actually give us our stall point. So to the left of this circle, we have a positive pressure differential. That equipment pressure is higher than our return pressure. Whereas to the other side, we have a lower pressure differential. So or, sorry, we have a negative pressure differential. That equipment pressure is lower than our back pressure. And what one thing this doesn't account for is oversurfacing. So I mentioned this earlier, but oversurfacing is actually just extra surface area accounted for, for this heat exchanger. And so we need to take that into consideration. Because our surface area is higher, it's actually gonna reduce our steam pressures in that same heat exchanger. So once we account for a 55% oversurfacing, it's actually gonna reduce our stall point, sorry, reduce our equipment pressure, and then creating a higher stall point. And so for this heat exchanger, we're always gonna be operating in a stall condition. Justin mentioned this article at the beginning, but if you're interested in learning more about the mechanisms of stall or the extended stall chart, please read this article. It can be found on the website or on the attachments of this webinar. And with that, I'll hand it back to Justin. Thank you, Alec. Now we just finished covering the topics or the concepts of stall, um, as well as how and why that might occur. So you're probably wondering, well, what do I need to do to overcome stall? And this is exactly the topic I'll be covering. And there are two basic methods for successful drainage of condensate when there is stall in your steam heated process equipment. The first of these methods utilizes a steam trap, was configured in such a way to allow gravity to work in our favor. This image I'm showing here is a shale and tube heat exchanger with steam supplied to the tube side. And this design is intended for condensate to pass through a steam trap and be discharged to an overhead or pressurized return. However, for seeing a stall condition within the equipment, then we're gonna to need to make some changes. So the first of these changes is to remove the back pressure as seen at the outlet of the steam trap and discharge that condensate safely to sewer. Now, of course, there's a cost to this, as doing so reduces the total amount of condensate and heat that is returned to the boiler. But it's the first step in this particular configuration to optimize the process heating performance. Next step, if possible, is to drop that steam trap all the way down as far as you can. And what this does is it allows for some extra piping volume so that if, it, if needed, Condensate is able to back up without flooding into the steam space for a process heater. That extra condensate upstream of the trap provides additional head pressure, thereby increasing the total available positive differential pressure seen at the trap. And this then helps to increase the trap capacity when lower steam pressures are present. And sometimes pressures can get so low that they're even at slight vacuum conditions. So for this very reason, we're always going to recommend to install a vacuum breaker on the steam space like I've shown here. 
Now, if and when steam pressures do drop into slight vacuum, the vacuum breaker will allow air to enter into the steam space, helping to increase the pressure upstream of the trap, allowing it to continue draining condensate. Now, tying this all together, it's critical that the selected steam trap is designed with an integral air vent. We want, to, want that basically to allow air to quickly pass through the system so that it doesn't impede the ability of steam to adequately provide heat to the process fluid. In some of our previous webinars, we discussed different air venting technologies, some that are great for discharging air during operation while everything's hot, and others that are better suited for discharging air only during startup. So with that in mind, it's very important that the uh, correct trap technology is selected so that air doesn't get stuck at the trap. Otherwise, this could, could, uh, excuse me, could cause condensate to indefinitely back up in the process heater, cause problems like corrosion, temperature stratification, and water hammer. So of course, there are some circumstances where this type of configuration is just not permissible where a specific facility might be trying to maximize heat and condensate recovery, or where that facility may be mandated by local or state law to return that condensate, or for some other reason. And in any case, really, if you must return that condensate, well then increasing the fill height upstream of the trap won't work, and adding a vacuum breaker won't work either, as these tools are really only effective when condensate is allowed to discharge immediately to an atmospheric condition. Good news is there's a solution, which brings us to our next topic. So the topic is power traps. Some of you might be more familiar with the term secondary pressure drainer. Now here's our familiar shell and tube process heater with the steam trap. I'm going to remove that steam trap, replace it with a power trap system. It's a little difficult to see right now, so let's rotate that image to get a better view. And let's zoom in a little bit too. I'm going to take away some of that background distraction so we can focus just on the power trap system. Now, if we're just starting up our system, the condensate is going to begin gravity draining into our reservoir, traveling down through some piping, and begin filling up our power trap. This condensate continues moving into the power trap system, it's displacing non condensable vapors, pushing it up through the balance line, up into the heating equipment and down into our reservoir and out an air vent. Now, if there's positive differential pressure on the power trap, it's gonna act just like a regular steam trap. It's gonna allow condensate to pass on through to our pressurized return. However, if there's a negative differential pressure on the power trap, condensate will continue filling inside the power trap until an internal mechanism is engaged, which allows high pressure motive source to enter the power trap and begin pushing the condensate to the pressurized return. So during this time, it's really important to understand that condensate is continuing to flow into the system. However, since the power trap is at a pressure higher than the rest of the system, the con uh, flow of condensate stops at the inlet check valve and it has to back up in the reservoir. Now, after all the condensate inside the power trap has been pumped out back to the return, it re-engages that internal mechanism, which allows the high pressure mode of steam to exhaust and balance back to the reservoir in the heating equipment steam space. Once all the pressures have equalized, condensate can begin flowing back into the power trap and that cycle starts all over again. So we've talked about the system and how that works as a whole, uh, but let's zoom in a little bit further to the power trap itself get a better look there. So this animation is showing all the major components of the power trap. It's gonna show how it functions in trapping mode and in pumping mode. Now, if we're in a scenario where there's positive differential pressure, condensate can flow into the power trap and discharges through a large double seated valve into the pressurized return. The float and trap valve operate the exact same way a lever float trap would operate during changes in condensate loads. Once the inlet pressure drops below the back pressure, condensate can no longer freely drain through to the return and instead backs up into the power trap body. And once that high limit is reached, the internal mechanism simultaneously opens the motor valve and closes the exhaust valve, 
This allows the power trap to fill with a high pressure mode of steam to push out that condensate back to return. As the float drops and reaches the lower limit, it's going to re engage that internal mechanism, closing the motor valve and opening the exhaust valve, allowing the high pressure mode of steam to exhaust back to the rest of the system. Now, coming back to the full system of the power trap, I want to bring back the uh, background back into focus. And we're going to focus on some very important pieces to make this whole system function the way we expect it to. Here's some key elevations we need to take note of. First is the elevation of the reservoir relative to the power trap. Now, as we increase this elevation, we're also increasing the available head pressure on the condensate entering the pump which allows it to fill more quickly, effectively giving it more capacity and allowing it to pump a fixed amount, of, a fixed amount in less time. Next important elevation is the equipment elevation. So ideally we want this to be high enough so that condensate can gravity drain the reservoir without any piping loops. And it's these two elevations that are gonna have a big determination on how many pumps are required and this can greatly impact the initial cost of the system. The next important piece to making sure that the system functions the way we expect it to is the equalization line. So here I'm showing the equalization line from the power trap to the reservoir. And now the equalization line from the reservoir to the steam space of the process heating equipment. And these equalization lines are absolutely critical for operation. And it's imperative to understand that any piping loops or low points are basically locations where condensate can build up, which could choke the system and prevent it from functioning. So now for a process here where steam is on the tube side, like I'm showing here, it's important to tie this into the steam space, but at a location below the channel head divider plate. Otherwise, you risk having a pressure imbalance which could also choke the system and prevent it from functioning. Now in applications where steam's in the shell, you would wanna instead balance like I've shown to the shell side vapor space. Exact location here is less critical than when steam's on the tube side, is simply because pressure drop through the shell uh, is much less than that through, uh, through that of tube side. So the risk here of choking the system is significantly reduced. Now for other configurations like air coils or plate and frame heaters, you should really try to balance the lowest pressure vapor space to make this all work properly. So sizing and selection is our next topic. And although this probably sounds absolutely frightening to you, I'm gonna promise that it's actually the easiest part because we're pretty much gonna do everything for you. So if you ever identify a process heater which is experiencing things like water hammer, needs frequent maintenance or repairs, you're having problems with off-spec products, or any of the other stall symptoms that Alec mentioned earlier, all we'll ask is that you fill out this form. We call us the Coil Drainage Application, or CDA. And once we've collected all the required data, we'll create a stall chart for your specific application. And that's gonna help us to identify the likelihood of stall and approximate the percentage of load demand for which stall is going to occur. We'll make specific recommendations, all included on a nice single report page like I've shown here. And it'll include things like an installation sketch, which can help to identify what your equipment might look like when installed with a power trap system. We'll also include some calculations, such as estimated stall load and pressures. We'll provide a list of all the recommended products with some important notes to consider for construction and installation. Now, if you're wanting TLV to design and build the system for you, we can absolutely do that. We can easily fabricate one of our many standard designs, including a single power trap configuration, a twin power trap configuration, a triple, or however many your system requires. And if you have specific design requirements or space constraints, we can help there too by designing custom solutions like I've shown here. Now, this particular one includes a completely redundant system all for a single application, and it all fits into a three foot by four foot by five foot boundary. 
The last on our topics of today is economic justification. So you sat through a webinar learning about various steam process heating configurations, and drainage methods for those heating applications. Now you're asking well, what kind of economic improvements you'll see. So before I get into specific examples, I want to discuss how we at TLV measure the economics in a concept we call steam system risk mitigation. And this all derived from risk-based inspection of API 580 and API 581. And it's the world's first risk assessment methodology for steam system assets. The first portion of this deals with the probability of failure of the steam asset, which is calculated by looking at the specific failure mechanism and generic failure frequency of the equipment. As well as uh, we're also looking at other factors like operating conditions and how frequently it's inspected. The next portion is the consequence or cost of failure. And it's the summation of all associated costs, such as production losses, replacement costs, and costs related to personnel injury if an event occurs. And multiplying these two values together gives us a quantified risk that we can then plot on a risk matrix. Left, left axis here shows the probability of failure while the bottom axis shows the financial consequence of that failure. So you can see that the deeper you go into the red section of, the, of this chart, you have an increased probability of failure and an increased consequence of failure. And the opposite can be said as you go further towards the bottom left into the green. You'll see two different risk values plotted. There's one in red here showing the quantified risk of an asset if steam is completely blowing through and one in blue showing the quantified risk from blocking any passage of condensate, such as in the case of maybe a trap being plugged with debris or even a stall situation. Once we have an evaluation of the current system, we can make recommendations and then reevaluate to see how the quantitative risk changes with those recommendations. And any change in quantified risk over time is effectively your payback. So let's take a look at some real examples. This first example is of a reboiler supplied by steam on the tube side. It drains to a level pot, like I've shown here. Now, while we were on site, we identified the condensate line violently shaking back and forth. And operators complained for a long time of needing to make frequent repairs. We identified that the level pot balance line was tied to the steam inlet and got temperature readings of 330 Fahrenheit at the level pot and 443 degrees Fahrenheit at the top of the balance line. So based on these readings, it seemed clear that condensate was one, subcooling and possibly backing up into the reboiler, but also being short-circuited with the balance line by much hotter steam supply. Now, all of this helped cause the water hammer and the shaking that we observed on site. So after evaluating the system, this is what our risk matrix looked like. So we recommended that the customer replace the level pot controls with the power trap system, which would help to improve reboiler control, eliminate the recurring damage to the equipment, and reduce the risks to safety around the equipment. And based on these changes, you can see how the quantified risk improved. In fact, we calculated a risk-based merit of $239,000 over a five-year period. All right. Our next example is, is very, very similar, where steam is supplied to the tube side, constate discharges to a level pot, and is balanced back to the steam supply side. The big difference that we noticed when we walked around to look at the level pot and control valve so we found that the level pot was completely empty and the control valve was wide open. And this both was implying that steam was probably blowing right through the return system. So in order to confirm this, we were able to open a downstream blowdown valve, which showed us that in fact, mostly live steam was blowing through, meaning there's possibility of significant fouling on the tube bundle. 
So based on data collected and input from plant personnel, our risk matrix looked like this. And you probably noticed that the red or the leak risk point, which reflects our current situation, is in the green area and probably doesn't pose a significant risk as is. However, if an event occurred which would cause a cold type failure, then that quantified risk would increase significantly. But by replacing or cleaning the two bundle and installing a power trap system, we identified a significant improvement to reliability as well as heating duty. So both of those helped to dramatically reduce the quantified risk and provided a risk merit of over a million dollars across a five-year period. Now I want to mention again this article about steam system optimization and this article about risk-based methodology, both of which will help you get a much clearer sense of the benefits to making improvements and optimizing your steam system. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions about our STEAM system applications, uh, you can always talk to our consulting engineering services group in North America. They can be reached by phone at 1-800-TLD-TRAP or by email at ces at tldengineering.com. Now, if you're not in North America, we do have 14 global offices. So please feel free to reach out to your TLD, uh, your local TLD office to ask any questions or inquire about how TLD's Consulting Engineering Services Group can help you with your STEAM system applications. Also encourage you to visit our TLD.com website where you can find links to an online calculator, any technical articles and other technical training resources, as well as this webinar recording and other recordings of webinars that we've previously conducted. So I want to thank you again for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed this webinar on optimizing steam process heating applications. And I hope that you'll join us in three weeks for our next webinar, where we'll be discussing how to increase energy savings through condensate and flash steam recovery. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend.